1973, William Freakin's The Exorcist shocked the world. Based on William Peter Blatty's novel, it was terrifying, all too real, but also legendary for its behind the scenes chaos. On set fires, random deaths, and the relentless insanity of its director, the film brought new meaning to the idea of a cursed production. And when it reached theaters, panicked moviegoers turned it into even more of a shit show. Peter Gunn was a TV crime drama that aired at the tail end of the 1950s. While it ran for over 100 episodes in three years, today the show is largely known for two things. That iconic theme, of course. And that it was created by Blake Edwards, the writer-director of classics like Breakfast at Tiffany's, 10, and the Pink Panther series. In 1966, Edwards was looking to revive Peter Gunn with a movie. He didn't want to direct it, so he sat down with an eager TV documentary director, William Friedkin, and asked for his thoughts on the current screenplay. Friedkin didn't lie and didn't mince words. And we sat opposite each other and he said, well, what did you think? And I said, Blake, I think your worst enemy would not have written this script for you. This is a terrible piece of shit. That's what you went with? Yeah. yeah. And I said, I could only be honest. Yeah. Edwards stood up, yelled at Freakin, pointing out his middling resume, then thanked him for the chance of meeting such an interesting person, and showed him the door. As he walked out to the parking lot, William Peter Blatty ran up to Freakin, confessed that he actually wrote the screenplay with Edwards, and he too knew it was terrible. But Blatty wanted Freakin to know how inspiring his honesty was in the face of a life-changing opportunity. They shook hands and departed. Years later, Bill Blatty, who mostly wrote film comedies, found himself without any job prospects and challenged himself to jump mediums and genres. Looking for inspiration, Blatty recalled a story circulating the press while he was attending Georgetown University. Rumors swirled about a local boy who received an exorcism, a somewhat outdated concept since, you know, well, since we learned about mental illness, paranoia, schizophrenia. Whether it was true or not, Blatty got started on a novel. Wanting to tackle the topic sincerely, he consulted with priests to make sure it was authentic to the long-abandoned practice. The Exorcist arrived on bookshelves in 1971, was an international success, and a New York Times bestseller for over a year. Reinvigorated, Blatty went around Hollywood trying to get it made into a film. Most studios were wary of making The Exorcist. The subject matter alone would be a lightning rod. Warner Brothers, though, saw it as a potential prestigious production. After they purchased the rights, Blatty signed on to produce and adapt his own work, and Warner Brothers aimed high for a director. Stanley Kubrick said no, as he only directed his own screenplays. Arthur Penn had his fill of violent cinema after finishing Bonnie and Clyde. And the graduates Mike Nichols didn't want to stake the success of an entire film on the performance of a 12-year-old kid. Blatty personally reached out to the Last Picture Show director Peter Bogdanovich, with a note saying if he doesn't do it, no one will. Bogdanovich said no. I thought, this needs an honest director that is not Catholic, that is agnostic on the subject, and can give this incredible story such a sense of documentary reality. Then Blatty remembered that overly honest director from a few years earlier. William Freakin was making his own way through Hollywood, and he had already developed the reputation of being an extremely blunt and tenacious filmmaker. He was about to release his biggest film yet, The French Connection, when he received a package from Bill Blatty containing his book. Freakin read the novel in a single sitting and called Blatty excited to join the production. However, Warner Brothers had already signed director Mark Rydell without Blatty's approval. Blatty was set to appear on The Tonight Show on Friday night, and he threatened Warner Brothers if they didn't choose Friedkin, he'd tell Johnny Carson about how the studio wasn't interested in making a good movie. That very Friday, the French connection hit theaters, and Warner Brothers suddenly changed their tune, giving Rydell the boot and hiring Friedkin. Little did they all know that the French connection would soon become not just a hit, but go on to win multiple Oscars the following year, including Best Picture and Best Director. By the time Freakin joined, Blatty had his screenplay ready, and history repeated itself. And I 
took it home and eagerly read through it, and I, I, I thought it was not very good. I thought it was overwrought. I thought that it was filled with a lot of symbolism, and it wasn't the novel. Blatty and Freakin then spent weeks going through the book line by line, building a better script. Because the book was so renowned, every actor in town wanted a part. Warner Brothers wanted major stars like Audrey Hepburn and Marlon Brando, but Freakin only wanted unknowns. I believe that, that the, the man who came on wearing the priest collar had to be an actor that was completely acceptable to the audience as a priest. And I, I really didn't want a character whose private life might in any way um, overshadow uh, his believability. Freakin originally cast Stacy Keach for Father Karras until he saw a play written by Jason Miller. Freakin just wanted to meet and congratulate him, and in the process, Freakin mentioned Blatty's novel. Days later, Miller called Freakin saying he just read The Exorcist and was blown away by the similarities of Father Karras and his own life, exclaiming, that guy is me. He pleaded with Freakin to let him audition. God damn you, take me! Which he reluctantly did. And a few days later, Freakin found himself explaining to Warner Brothers why he had hired Jason Miller, a man who had never acted in a film before, and fired Stacy Keach, who had a pay or play deal, meaning he would be paid in full whether he did the movie or not. As for Reagan, the possessed little girl, Freakin was very aware that not only would the actress obviously need to be talented, she would need to be a resilient soul that wouldn't come out of this experience scarred by the process and subject matter. Freakin saw over 500 actresses and began thinking Mike Nichols was right. Then Linda Blair came in. So I asked her if she knew anything about The Exorcist book. And she said, oh yes, I read it. I said, you read this book? Yeah. I said, what's it about? She said, it's about a little girl that gets possessed by the devil and does a whole bunch of bad things. And I said, well, like what? And she said, well, she hits her mother across the face and she pushes a man out of her bedroom window and she masturbates with a crucifix. And I looked at her mother, who was still smiling. When I was filming, I would go to this little uh, restaurant, which was in the Jesuit quarters, and this very, very old priest handed me this little medal of the Blessed Virgin. He said, you know why I'm giving you this? I said, why? He said, I want to tell you something about intervention. Did you ever hear the concept of intervention? I said, no. He said, it's a Gnostic concept. It comes out of the 15th century. If you do anything on the devil, anything at all on the devil, to reveal him as the trickster that he is, he will seek retribution against you. Either or he will even try to stop what you're trying to do to unmask him. And he said, this medal will protect you. He said, you be, be very careful you take care of yourself. I had to maybe about three days later. So I'm walking down the hall going to dinner one day, and I walked by and I said, did I see a, a casket in there? And I walk back and I look in the room and there's this old priest in a casket, dead. Production started in August of 1972. After a six week delay because Freakin was unhappy about the house set and fired the production designer forcing a rebuild. It wasn't a great start and an omen of what was to come. My dear friend Billy Friedkin is a maniac. <laughs> And I love him, uh, but he's a maniac. Freakin earned his onset nickname of Wacky Willie. The cast and crew found him to be entirely irrational and were worried about what would set him off next. It wasn't that rare for Freakin to reduce grown men to tears or for someone to get fired, then rehired in the same conversation. He was a director dead set on authenticity and went to any lengths needed to get real reactions from his actors. He hid guns around the set and fired them without warning to shock the actors. When actual priest William O'Malley wasn't giving Freakin what he wanted for the film's climax, Freakin resorted to slapping him. He belted me right across the chops and backed off and I went in the scene and if you look at that carefully, when I'm giving the last right, my hand's going like that. And I wasn't making my hand go like that, that was sheer nerve juice and all I had left. During the scene where Reagan attacks her mother, Ellen Burstyn was injured when she was tugged to the ground. When she stated this fact, Freakin had the stuntmen pull her even harder, using her actual screams of pain in the final film. 
<laughs> and Friedkin wasn't afraid of severing friendships for his art. Blatty, as a first time producer, let Friedkin walk all over him. When Blatty actually fired Friedkin to prove his seniority, Friedkin quietly left, then returned the following Monday with an army of Warner Brothers lawyers. The studio sided with Friedkin and essentially gave him full control. Without Blatty's ability to rein him in, the final budget ballooned to three times its original four million. There was definitely a method to his madness, but many viewed it as Friedkin letting that Oscar go to his head. After all, he did write Oscar winner of French Connection on his director's chair. In Freakin's mind, a calculated amount of terror, peppered with moments of legitimate praise, would produce a crew yearning to please. Well, it was a very difficult film. Um, Billy was reaching for the limit. He was committed to it, and he was obsessed by it himself, and, uh, and that obsession was contagious. In a purely pre-digital age, every effect in the movie was achieved practically, from realistic dummies to overlaid images. For the effect of seeing the actor's breath, the set used meat locker air conditioners to cool the room, and Freakin wouldn't shoot until it was negative 20 degrees or below. But as soon as the lights were on and the cast and crew were in the room, they could only shoot minutes at a time before the set would gradually heat back up and the effect was lost. When Max von Sydow and Linda Blair required four hours of makeup, it didn't make for very productive days. Then the air conditioners kept breaking down, causing more delays and cost overruns. It took 60 days to shoot the exorcism scenes alone. And poor Linda Blair. Everyone on set adored Blair, and she was a tremendous sport. Bernstein and Freakin took it upon themselves to be surrogate parents to her. She needed to trust them implicitly because she was about to go through the ringer. She was often tied to the bed for hours, wearing very little in a below freezing room. The men all had their, uh, the, the old ski suits that look a lot like, kind of like a space uniform, you know? And they're walking around kind of like that. And me, I got, you know, long underwear and, and a nightgown. Lucky me. <laughs> the demonic contact lenses irritated her eyes immensely, so they started using anesthetic drops to numb her eyes for hours on end. The throw-up mechanism wouldn't allow her to physically close her mouth. While being thrashed around on the bed, her harness came loose, and the metal backing smashed into her back over and over. Her cries for help in the film were again real. And when Freakin needed her to reach emotional depths, he would remind her of the recent death of her grandfather. Yeah, I don't think anybody's ever understood how hard it was for my end. If Freakin's chaos wasn't enough, external forces kept production under a cloud of doom and gloom. Death seemed to surround production, mostly indirectly. Actors Jack McGowan and Vasiliki Maliros died shortly after finishing their parts, but no one died on set. Yet with the additional deaths of a studio night watchman, Max von Sydow's brother, the assistant cameraman's baby, and many others, the crew started drawing parallels to their own tragedies with the production of The Exorcist. All of this made the cast and crew question if the film was cursed. Then a pigeon flew into a circuit box and the house set burned to the ground, delaying the film for another six weeks. It's very simple. If you have a production that lasts two weeks or three weeks, nothing happens. But if you have a production that lasts for a year or nine months, a lot of things has, have to happen. Uh, accidents one way or the other. It's very good for publicity. But if you don't believe in them, you don't believe in curses. Simple. Some even believe the curse followed long after the film was finished. Warner Brothers, by the way, was at 666 Fifth Avenue, <laughs> which is an address that still exists, and the building is owned by Jared Kushner. <laughs> so process that. Linda Blair received death threats for years. Radiographer Paul Bateson, who cameoed in the film, became a convicted murderer. And executive producer Noel Marshall took five years making this. Oh, are you hiding here? Oh, yeah. Even after an excruciating nine-month production, the nightmare wasn't over. Upon hearing the score written by Mission Impossible composer Lalo Schifrin, Freakin said it sounded like Mexican marimba music. He grabbed the recording and threw it into the parking lot. To produce Reagan's demonic voice, Freakin bound actress Mercedes Cambridge to a chair, per her instructions, and fed her raw eggs and whiskey. 
He cut the infamous spider walk scene because he hated that the wires were too visible, later restored and fixed digitally in the 2000 Blu-ray cut. And the first trailer was deemed too terrifying for audiences. Once Freakin' was done with the edit, Blatty was blown away. It surpassed his wildest expectations. However, Warner Brothers suggested some edits that Freakin' agreed helped with the pacing. He cut 12 minutes, which Blatty outright protested. Most importantly, two scenes. One between the two priests, discussing possession, that Blatty felt was the heart of the film. Why this girl it makes no sense. I think the point is to make us despair. And the more optimistic ending that freaking axed to leave the film ambiguous. I don't want him to think the devil won. I just don't well, I, you know, to me, it's how could they possibly think that? Warner Brothers went with the shorter version and Blatty refused to speak with Freakin' for years. The Exorcist was hurled into theaters on December 26, 1973, and the release can only be described as hysteria. Mainstream audiences were still a year away from Texas Chainsaw Massacre and the beginning of the ultra-violent slasher genre, and outside of grindhouse cinemas, they weren't prepared for something so visceral. People lost their damn minds. You ever get the feeling something really bad is about to happen? They ran out of the theater screaming. They fainted. They threw up. Second time we've seen it, we still can't hack it. I don't know why I waited four hours to see that. There were reports worldwide of theaters needing kitty litter for cleanup and others providing puke bags. Oh God, I can't believe it. I'm not going back in there. One person fainted, hit their face on a seat broke their jaw, sued, and won. I guess it bothered her more than it bothered me. I don't know what happened. I just fainted. Then I went to Floyd's chain. Oh my god, I've never done anything like it. Another was convinced they were seeing real demons and attacked the screen. <laughs> Controversy brewed about the MPAA allowing the film to be rated R and not giving it an X. Hundreds started calling their own priests, demanding exorcisms for their family members or themselves. And depending on the Catholic priest you were talking to, they either thought the film was evil incarnate or tremendously respectful to their faith. The pandemonium played out on the nightly news for months. And whether it was real or overhyped by Warner Brothers, it was free publicity. People had to see what the fuss was all about and lined up around the block for hours on end. People were lined up at seven or eight o'clock in the morning, you see a 10.30 uh, screaming and couldn't get yeah. in and got angry and there was almost a riot. I want to see if it's gonna make me throw up. While reviews at the time were generally more harsh, over the years the film has gained an impressive amount of respect, with film buffs calling it haunting, effective, and expertly crafted. All told, The Exorcist was beyond successful, grossing over 30 times its budget, becoming the highest grossing film of all time. It was nominated for 10 Academy Awards, including First Time Actor, Jason Miller, and Best Picture, making it the first ever horror film to do so, and William Peter Blatty won for Best Adapted Screenplay. Today, The Exorcist is revered for its influence on film history, and for good reason, from its stamp on pop culture to the way it legitimized horror movies. But rarely are classics like this given a second look to empathize with those involved in making it. Was it worth it? Did the cast and crew really have to endure William Freakin? Did the ends justify the means? It was way beyond what uh, anyone needs to do to make a movie. He had a total freedom, I think. And, uh, and of course he behaved like a man with total freedom and total power. It wasn't until I saw the film later on that I truly was stunned they did an opening in New York. All these people are gathered, you know, like a big party of thing, you know, um, I'm sitting probably midsection. And what I knew as the movie closed was that I had just been part of something that would change my life forever. I knew that. I didn't know how and why, but I knew that. And then they gave me the, a standing ovation. And that, it meant a lot. I didn't know why. I did. 27 years later, Warner Brothers asked Freakin if he was interested in updating The Exorcist for the Blu-ray release. 
Freakin saw this invitation as an olive branch to his friend. For 25 years, Bill Blatty would hock me every day about the 12 minutes that I took out of it. And I used to call him a sore winner. I'd say, Bill, the, the film is a success. Leave me alone. And I love Bill Blatty. He passed away last year. And I wanted him to be ultimately happy with the film. So I asked him to come out to California. We went to Warner Brothers, and we looked at the footage that I had cut. And after I saw it with Bill on a moviola, I remember putting my arm around him and I said, well, Bill, I finally understand what you were getting at. And I added the 12 minutes back. 